Okay, so this week we have a new parsha, but a whole new book. The book of Bamidbar, the book of Numbers. And the parsha is also called Bamidbar, which means in the desert. And that's because the first verse, Hashem spoke to Moshe in the desert of Sinai, in the Sinai Desert. And he gave him an instruction. And what's the instruction? To count the people. This is not the first time, nor the last time, that the Jewish people are being counted. And the bulk of, well, first chapter, which is the bulk of the parsha, is going to be discussing the counting, the methodology of the counting, and the results of the counting. How many people are there? What's the objective? Remember, God is telling Moshe to count the people. God doesn't need help counting. He doesn't need Moshe to do that. So everyone's trying to figure out what the objective of this counting of the nation is. What is the need to do such a process? What, why do we need to have a census? So Rashi tells us, and this is a theme that Rashi repeats several times in, throughout the Torah, brought from the Talmud, is that the Almighty loves the Jewish people so much, just like a really rich person who has, loves his money, wants to always count it, even though you know the answer. You know, you just like looking at your bank account. It just gives you joy. So too, the Almighty loves the Jewish people. We give him joy, so to speak, and therefore he likes to count us, even though he knows the number, but there's a certain joy, so to speak, that he, a certain love that he has for us that is manifest by his counting of our, uh, of our numbers. This is the antithesis of the way we count today. Uh, like, you know, we have an election. It's all about raw numbers. We don't, you know, the votes don't matter vis-a-vis who is the one submitting them. It doesn't matter if it's a professor who really knows a lot about geopolitical science and all that versus some guy who just doesn't even, is not even involved in the political process. They all equal to the same number. Uh, and, and our vote is all about the masses. Who, who could, who could amass the greater number of supporters behind them? As opposed to over here, it's about uplifting the individual. And in fact, the verse, in verse 2, the way it, the actual Hebrew words of making the count is se'u esrosh kol adatz b'nei Israel, uplift, which is a way of, of saying count. But it's about uplifting the individual uh, to show that each Jew is valuable before God. And moreover, who is the one who is doing this counting, the census? It's Moshe, it's Aaron. And it's the heads of each one of the tribes. So you think about it. Who do you usually want to do these census? You have bureaucrats who sit at desks who are experts at counting and not really s- remarkable in any way. Here you have Moshe and Aaron and the heads of the tribes. So these are the leaders of the people that are going to count the individuals. And the method that they actually use to count – was each person submitted a coin and they would count the coins. But the way it would work is that Moshe and Aaron and the head of the tribe, they would go, they'd have a meeting with every family, and they'd sit down and talk to them, who are you, what's your name, where you're from, where you're from? we all know where they're from, but uh, what's your father, and kind of get to know them. And Moshe would, would talk to them. And then Aaron would give them a blessing. And they'd feel like they're not just another guy. They're part, you know, they have a direct connection with Moshe. And more broadly, we know that the role of the prophet, there's over 900 years of Jewish history, we had something called a prophet. And the role, one of the prime roles of the prophet was to give guidance and direction to the people. You know, we are dropped into this world and we don't have a direct guide, instruction guide personalized for us of what we should do. We have the Torah, of course. The Torah is a general guide that's mandatory for, for all Jews to live within that framework. But what about me? What's my mission here? How am I different than my neighbor? That's a hard question. It's a very vexing question that we have to, we have to face in our life to try to find our own purpose and our own meaning in life. One of the roles of the prophet was to guide people. You would go to the prophet, and the prophet would be able to have a penetrating look into your essence, into your qualities, into your objective of life. And he would say, okay, this is what you need to do. You need to accomplish four or five things. This is it. And you could have kind of a more directed focus at what you're doing. You know, now 
we're we're mystified. You know, what it is what is it that we are specifically supposed to what's our mission over here? And as an aside, I may add that um, one of my uh, antecedents, my great grandfather, is one of the titans of uh, pre-war Europe, the Jewish uh, teachers and scholars and leaders, Rabbi Abraham Grzynski. He was uh, killed by the Nazis in 1944. But he wrote an amazing book called Torah Savram of his lectures and his essays. And he has a whole section about suffering, pain. And he says in one of his essays that the role of the prophet of yore was to provide guidance of what a person should focus on in their life. Now, we don't have any prophets, but that is replaced by pain and suffering. The Almighty loves us, yet sometimes he gives us an elbow in the chest. Sometimes he kind of makes life rocky and chaotic and painful. Says my great-grandfather, Whatever, whenever you, you have a pain that's t- delivered to you by God, you should know that God's giving you a message and trying to guide you towards what it is that is your specific mission in life. But when we had prophets, it was an amazing time to be alive. You, had, you could go to the prophet. The Talmud even talks about how people would go for the prophets. If you lost your iPhone, what do you do? And, and it's the reader's not on, right? What do you do? You go to the prophet. In fact, uh, when Saul, who became the first king of Israel... He had an encounter with Samuel, and he went to Samuel because he was missing his donkey. And Saul says, oh, I'll tell you where your donkey is, but oh, by the way, you're going to be the king of Israel. It was an amazing boon for the nation to have a prophet around. And here we're talking about the greatest prophet of all time. It's Moshe. Moshe is the father of all prophets. And he's the greatest man that has ever lived. And you walk in there, and you have a, you have a sit-down with him. He, He's counting the people, yes, nominally, that's, that, that's the objective. But this, is, this book is about what's the Jewish nation going to be. You know, there's not a lot of mitzvahs in the book of Numbers. It's the status of the nation in the Midbar, in the, uh, in the wilderness, in the desert. Everything about this process of counting them is about uplifting. And they have a sit-down with Moshe, they get a blessing from Aaron, and their stature is forever uplifted. This counting starts, the first verse tells us, in the second month of the second year of when they left. So this is 13 months after the Exodus. Uh, They have been at Sinai for almost a year. They already built the tabernacle. So this is all the tabernacle stuff is all done. And now they have a tabernacle. And indeed, that essentially kickstarts everything else that follows because now they count the nation, they're going to set up the nation. How, where does everyone go? Where, where are the encampments? All that is after the tabernacle is done. We'll see why. That's the objective. And the Torah delineates all the heads of the tribe. It goes through one by one, Reuven, Shimon, Levi, Yehuda, etc. Uh, and gives us all their names. Who are these people that are going to be with Moshe and Aaron? Who are these representatives of the tribes? And they gather everyone together, and they begin this uh, census. The census begins, uh, they only count people that are 20 years and older. And the reason for that is because these are the people that are the soldiers, the warriors. People are eligible to be drafted. And we know the people are going to have to uh, partake in several wars. We'll read about that in the end of Numbers. And therefore, it seems like, you know, that's a, that's the prudent thing to do. You know, we uh, right now are in the middle of the 50th anniversary of the Six-Day War, the Jewish date. The Jewish date of the beginning of the Six-Day War is tomorrow, Monday. Just parenthetically, if anyone's interested, I have a Jewish history podcast in which I already gave part one of the Six-Day War, and part two is upcoming this Tuesday. If you're interested in hearing about this, especially in this uh, anniversary, you can listen to it. But I'm doing a lot of research about the, uh, about the Six-Day War. And one of the things that I read was that the, there was a huge revamp of the Israeli army in 1964. Uh, Rabin and Eshtol, uh, the um, chief of staff of the army and the prime minister, they undertook a massive upgrading 
of the army. Previously, it, it wasn't even organized. Like even the uniforms weren't uniform. Some uniforms had stripes and some didn't. The the arms were all uh, varied, and they modernized the army in sixty four and sixty five. And people didn't really know, certainly the Arabs didn't know, uh, even the Israelis didn't know how potent an army that they had cultivated. Now, the truth is, it was still vastly uh, smaller in number than the Arabs. The Arabs had millions of soldiers and they uh, outnumbered the tanks and planes by orders of magnitude. Uh, But still, like the army was was very much. I read that right before the war – they went to a scroll and said, okay, this is the amount of soldiers we have and the amount – and everything's optimal. We, we, we'd love to have six more planes. That's what he said. They, they had around 200 fighter planes. But they, everything besides – but with the exception of six more planes, we're, we're at perfect uh, capacity. That's what I read uh, recently. So you think about it. Moshe here. We know we're counting the nation and we're the verses we're, we're, you know, we're told – that he's counting the nation because only 20 and up, these are people eligible for military. And look at verse 19 here. Um, they count the people, Ka'asher Tziva Hashem as Moshe, like Hashem commanded Moshe, and he counted them in the desert of Sinai. So now, we have an instruction from God to count the people. We have Moshe doing it, and immediately afterwards it says, Moshe did it like Hashem told him, wait a minute. Obviously, Hashem just told him to do it, and he did it. So why is it necessary to preface that Moshe, you know, the Moshe actually implemented it by saying he did it like Hashem told him? Well, isn't that obvious? Well, you just told me a second ago Hashem told him, and he did it. Obviously, he did it because Hashem told him to do it. So I think there's a very powerful lesson here. Perhaps you may consider that, yes, Hashem told Moshe to do this counting, but, you know, there's another reason to do it. You know, there's the uh, militaries before conflicts. It's quite natural for them to try to assess their power that they have. So perhaps Moshe did it like Hashem told it to him, but Moshe also did it because, well, Moshe is the head of the army, he's the head of the nation, and therefore he had some other reason based upon other reasons aside from God directly telling him to do it. So he wanted to do it as a military commander. Says the Torah, Moshe did it for one purpose only, only because Hashem told him to do it. It was only solely due to the instruction of God to the exclusion of any other objective. Why did Moshe count the people? Only because Kasher Tziv Hashem, like Hashem, commanded them. And I think there's a very powerful and, dare I say, counterintuitive message here. We think that mitzvos that we can understand are easier to do. If it's a mitzvah that makes sense to us, it's easier for us. We don't have to kind of overcome a certain hump to do it. The opposite is actually true. To do a mitzvah it means to do a commandment of God. It doesn't mean to do something that you would have done otherwise. Whenever we have to do something that we feel naturally inclined to do it anyhow, in order to make it into a mitzvah, we have to reckon, we have to we have to kind of strip away any other reason and say we're doing this for because of God. And I always say this that like if you give, if you give someone a hitch, right? I don't, people don't do hitches anymore. But if you give someone a ride, right? You say, eh, I'm going there anyhow. Eh, I could have done. I would have done it for anyone. What you appropriately should say, I'm doing it because I'm doing it because Hashem told me to do it. Hashem told me to be kind, and that's the only reason why I'm doing it. And that's hard for us to do because we we naturally feel like we want to do it. But to actually do it as a mitzvah, to gain the benefit of the mitzvah, is to say I'm doing it because Hashem told me to do it. I'm not counting the nation because as an army instructor, it's prudent for me to assess the strength of the forces. No, I'm doing it because the Almighty told me with no other reason at all. A little bit counterintuitive idea. Now, we go through the counting one by one, and this is a, a, a theme we see again several times in the book of Numbers, that the, it was possible to make it a little bit more, a little bit more succinct, a little more brevity could have been achieved, um, uh, yet it was ignored. 
uh, because every we go through tribe by tribe, and we have the same kind of introduction of each tribe, and then we have the numbers of the tribe. And it's quite simply, you could have done it, you could have written it differently, you could have said, and they counted. Here, so every verse begins like this. They were the, these were the sons of Ruvain, their offspring according to their families, according to the father's household, by number of the names, according to the head of the ca- head count, every male from 20 years and of age and up, everyone who goes out to the legion. And that introduction is found by all 12 tribes. Well, you could have said, and these are the, these are the counting of all the tribes, and give that whole introduction, they say Ruvain, Shimon, Le, right? Sure, you could have simplified it. And I, I think this... This does dovetail nicely with what we've said earlier. The objective of the count is to uplift the individuals. It's not just about numbers. And therefore, each tribe is given their own spotlight, as if each tribe on its own is so valuable that we're going to expend the very precious attention and the very precious space in the Torah for each tribe to have their moment in the spotlight. Now, what's also interesting here is that if you look at the numbers, so for example, the tribe of Reuven is 46,500 people, men. Uh, Shimon is 59,300. God is 45,650. And it goes through, and they're all very round numbers. Um, Menashe, 32,200. Benjamin, 35,400. And it's, uh, it seems to be kind of statistically improbable that all the tribes would all have a perfectly round number. Um, and it's possible, right? You could say, well, it's, it's possible. It's, it's exceedingly unlikely. It's, it's astonishingly improbable for it to happen by chance. And this was just a good question. Like, like, well, why is it that all the tribes end up with a round number. Uh, all 12 tribes plus the 13th tribe, the tribe of Levi, they all have round numbers ending either with a 50 or with a 100. Simply we could say, listen, that's just the way it was. Um, uh, alternatively, I saw two other answers. Uh, perhaps we could say that, they, yeah, they rounded it off to the nearest 100. Um, but if they rounded it off to the nearest 100, how come there's one of them that has 50? So someone theorized in shul yesterday. I asked someone in shul yesterday. So he he theorized maybe because this tribe actually the number was fifty, and fifty you can't round to the nearest hundred because it's right in the middle. So therefore fifty they just kept to fifty because you can't round to the nearest hundred. Every other number they rounded it either up or down to the nearest hundred. That's what he said. Interesting. Uh, but I did see another another reason behind this. If you remember all the way back to Exodus. When Yisro comes, Jethro, Moshe's father-in-law, and he comes and creates order. And he says there's groups of, hun- of 10 and 50 and 100 and 500, 10,000, etc. What he actually did was uh, create the equivalent of a military structure. You have a, you have a company and a platoon and a battalion and, and an army and a legion, and right? All those different groups. Here we're counting them for the purposes of assessing the army or at least nominally uh, so. And therefore, they were broken into groups of 50, and some of them were 50, and some of them were 100. That's, I think, a, a good way of understanding uh, this idea. So we count the whole, the whole nation, and at the end, uh, we have a recap. What's the total number? 603,550. That's the final number. But verse 47 tells us that this is not including the Levites. The tribe of Levi, they were included. In fact, they're going to be counted at the end of the parsha, but separately. They're not going to be counted along with everyone else. Verse 47 and verse 49 says, don't, the Levites weren't counted. And God tells Moshe in verse 49, but the Levites should not be counted. Don't uplift them amongst the nation. Instead, give them jobs. Really, really strange juxtaposition here. Don't count them, but give them the the jobs of maintaining and carrying and overseeing the tabernacle and all the and all the vessels. So, so Rashi here gives us a little guidance here. 
why are we not counting the Levites, but also we're not counting them in that context. We're counting them in a different context, and we are not um, – but we're giving them jobs. This seems a kind of strange. So Rashi tells us uh, that first reason why the Levites are not counting with everyone else is because there's the legion of the nation, and then there's the legion of the king. And the legion of the king, which is the Levites, they should be counted independently. And they had a separate role. They were responsible for the spiritual leadership of the people. Therefore, they're distinct and they should be counted separately. That's the first reason. And the second reason is that the Almighty knew that all these people that are going to be counted 40 years hence when they, Joshua is going to lead the people into Israel. We know right now everyone's in the assumption that they're going into Israel right away. They just left. They had a, a year at Sinai. That's it. They're ready to go. And we'll see events transpire in the book of Numbers that really change that and causes them to have 40 years of wandering. But over the course of those 40 years, all these people that are counted are all going to die and a whole new generation is going to enter the land of Israel. Uh, uh, land of Israel. And therefore, God says, I don't want the Levites to be amongst the counting because all the people that are going to be counted are going to, are, are going to die. I don't want them necessarily to die, and therefore I'm going to exclude them. And the idea being is that whenever someone is lumped into a group, they become part. We, we have a personal identity, certainly as Jews, and a communal identity. And there are some times where there are decrees or edicts that are meted out against the community, against the, 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 the general populace. And here, by counting the individuals and lumping them together as one number, it creates a certain block. And that block, we know, are going to all die in, in, the, in the wilderness. We want the Levites to be separate from that block vis-a-vis this counting in order that they should have the chance to survive. Not all of them will necessarily die. And the question is, why? Rashi tells us that the Levites didn't participate in the golden calf. And we know the golden calf uh, was the, uh, you know, one of the worst sins of the nation. And that, of course, is a cause for the people to, to, to die. They didn't participate, therefore they shouldn't die. And the question that I saw posed, interesting question, we know there's a concept of repentance. So even the people that did participate in the golden calf, they could have repented and they could have atoned for their misdeeds. Why is this Levite being placed on a pedestal to be the legion of God and not be counted separately and they'll, they won't die. Why can't everyone do repentance and uh, and be on the same stature? Uh, so I, I don't have a good answer to the question. Uh, I have a possible answer that perhaps there is a certain, you know, there's a certain kind of clean slate that we want for someone to be part of this legion of God, the special a uh, group of people that are that are total. They have to be totally pure. To be totally connected to God, they have to be totally pure. It's kind of like we want a squeaky clean record for certain for certain responsibilities, for certain tasks, for certain groups of people. And therefore, the Levites they had to eat. Yes, of course, someone who repents and someone who atones for their misdeeds, they are able to rectify. But for certain tasks, it's important to have people that. Don't even have that history. Interesting idea. I, I, I'm, I'm not fully convinced by it, um, but something to think about. The Levites are not counted, but are given jobs. So, what does that ha- juxtaposition have to do? We're not counting them, but we're giving them jobs. How is it? You know, how is it connected? What's the internal connection? And I think, according to the uh, understanding of the counting that we gave earlier, that it's about uplifting the individual. We counted them and they're being Moshe and they're getting a blessing and, you know, they're getting a certain position, uh, a certain stature in the nation. We could perhaps say that there's maybe even a higher, um, a higher recognition of the individual when he's not just counted and valued as an individual, but is given a task by God. And Moshe would go and tell the, tell the Levites, you, God wants you to do a job for him, so to speak. And that is even higher. So don't count them. The, the, the Levites, they're on a higher 
plateau. Don't count them. They're not on the level of counting that God wants to know. God wants to. God loves them, cherishes them, and wants to value them as an individual. They're even on a higher level. God wants to give them a task. And I think that idea is broadly applicable for us. You know, we talk about chosen people, and chosen people. People is kind of a term that we say. And they may be a little uncomfortable with it because it sounds a little bit like, you know, we, you know, we're better. We don't want to say that. It's, but w- what are we chosen for by whom? We're chosen by God to have Torah and to have responsibility. And it's – the reason why it's special is because we're saying when we say chosen people is that the Almighty gives us mitzvos, rules and restrictions and requirements of the Torah – and he is asking us to do things. You know, we are special because the Almighty Creator of heaven and earth and all the cosmos and all the species says to us, lowly mortal humans, do stuff. And that is pretty powerful. That the idea of someone being, you know, there's a certain stature of someone who is an assistant to the president or to the king uh, or to the general. You know, and it's a privilege to do jobs for important people. People would do this for free. People intern at, at these big companies. They do it for free. They, they, they all covet. Why? You're coveting getting coffee for someone else? Well, if the person is important and you get to kind of do stuff for them, it's valuable for you. It means you're a special. You put on your resume. I interned at uh, Google, right? That, that, that's a big deal. If you could intern, so to speak, for God, you could do tasks for him. How great is that? Think about how that looks on the uh, on the resume, and that's what, that's why we're special because we have jobs given to us by God, and He says it's for us to do, and we can do it and fulfill a great destiny. That's chapter one, counting the people. In the end, we say that there's a certain encampment that the nation has. In the middle, there's the Levites, and surrounding them is the Israelites. Chapter two talks about these flags. And the positions of the encampment uh, of the encampments. Hashem speaks to Moshe and Aaron to tell them each uh, nation, each tribe shall have a banner or a flag and have a, an insignia logo symbol, and they should be placed in a certain location around the uh, around the camp. And Rashi tells us, for example, that the each color of each flag was different, and the color of each flag. It mirrored the color of the stone relating of that particular tribe in the breastplate. We know the Kohen Gadol wore a breastplate, 12 stones. Each stone said the name of the tribe, of one of the 12 tribes. And that color, that was the same color as was, as was found in the, uh, in, the, in the flag of the tribe. And moreover, there was some symbolism on the flag that was tailored to the specific qualities of of the tribes. We've seen this idea several times in the Torah that each tribe had a certain power, a certain role amongst the nation. And that was highlighted in their tribe. Uh, and the Midrash tells us that at Sinai, when the people experienced prophecy at Sinai, they saw legions of angels carrying flags. Now, what this means is a great mystery because angels and flags, is it physical flags? What's going on? Uh, but the Matrix tells us that they said, oh, these angels have flags. We want the same thing. And the Almighty obliged and gave each one of them a certain flag. Now, I think just on a simple level, how, how we understand that, what's the role of the angel? The angel has only one goal. The only goal of the angel is to do the will of God. That's, what, that's the definition of an angel. The human, what's our goal? Well, it depends. We have to choose what our goal is. Are we going to be like an angel or are we going to be like an animal? Because the human is a, is a fusion of an angel and an animal, of a body and a soul. At Sinai, the people saw angels carrying flags, whatever that means, but they said, we want to be like angels. We want to opt to a favor and embrace our soul. And therefore, God says, okay, this is what you look like at the nation at its acme is like those angels carrying flags with a unified mission to do the will of the Almighty. So it's a continuation of the theme of the parasha, that each 
tribe and each individual the part of a collective whole, but the underlying objective is to do the will of God, and each one has a specific mission. Now, it's interesting that we've been a a year into this experiment of this Jewish nation, and only now we get the flags. Wouldn't it, and, and, and and the location of each tribe, because there were four corners, right? The Mishnah was in the center, surrounded by the Levites. And then there were four uh, quadrants. Um, there's the north and the, and the east and west and the south. And in each one of those four, there were three tribes. It tells us which tribes went together. And each one, had, and each one of them had their flags. This could have began way earlier. They leave Egypt first thing. Here's, here's your tribe. Here's your flags. Here's who goes and marches alongside you. Why does it wait till after the mission's finally finished? Right then, they begin this process. And I think there's another powerful lesson here. When we, you know, we're, we're part of a tribe. We, lo- we look at our tribe and we have, okay, this is what the flag represents. There's a certain role and responsibility that we have. But there's a danger of pride and arrogance. And competition. Everyone is so prideful of their flag and they say, this is us and we're better. Even today, you know, we go to the Olympics. Every, every flag that represents every country is like, this is a pride. This, we're, this is us. You know, we're Norwegians and you guys are just lowly, I don't know, Ecuadorians, <laughs> right? Uh, that, that's a problem. And we're, we're still united as a nation. And we don't want to be divided as tribes. And this is, I think, even more than just the pride of uh, a nation. The flags themselves represented the deep qualities of each tribe. So there's even a greater danger when, when, the, when the flags themselves actually represent something substantive, not just national pride. So what's going to be? If we had the flags prior – before the Mishnah was erected, then there'd be the risk of competition. Once you have the Mishnah erected, it's in the middle. All the tribes, they're all surrounding that one objective that, uh, that, 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 that is what everyone's trying to strive for. Then it doesn't make sense for us to have any pride. You know, they made a poll of NFL players. We know there's 22 different positions. It's a complicated game. Every time I try to explain it to my wife, she doesn't get it. But somehow my uh, son in second grade knows all the rules. <laughs> so they, they, made a, they made a poll of NFL players. What's the most valuable position? So almost everyone said quarterbacks. But what did the quarterbacks say? Offensive linemen. Because those are the big, you know, the big guys who actually protect them. They, they don't uh, get all the uh, accolades. But what this means is that in order to have a functioning team, everyone has to know their role. The, the ultimate goal is to win the game or to win the drive or to score a touchdown, right? That, that's the ultimate goal. And if for it to be efficient, everyone has to do their job and their job only. And these are different, very different physiques and different, very different qualities. And, and what you look for in an offensive lineman is the probably the exact opposite of what you look for in a receiver or a running back. And – but as a team, that's when you operate at, at pink fun because you have one unified goal. Jewish people, yes, there's different – Groups and different qualities and, and the tribe of Yisachar, the tribe of Don and the tribe of Benjamin, these are all different. But together they make a team. And once you have the mission in the center, everyone realizes that we're a team working for a unified goal. And then it's okay for people to know that their own distinct qualities are unique to them. That's There's not, nothing wrong with someone knowing I'm particularly gifted in one area. We, we, to us, we think of pride and arrogance versus humility as being someone not to recognize their qualities. No. The way it's supposed to be, you're supposed to know your qualities. You're supposed to have your flag and be pr- proud of, of your particular qualities that I gave you to do your responsibilities. However, it has to be predicated on a recognition that it's all towards the mission. It's all towards service of God. And when you have that, then there is no pride because the Almighty gave me my task to do for my responsibility 
and you have your task to do for your responsibility, but together, we're working together for the same goal. I think it's a good idea for us to realize, um, just with regards to our own self-perception, uh, for example, it's one applicable, applicable lesson. If someone recognizes that they have qualities, that's okay and that's good because if you don't know what qualities you have, you don't know what flag you have, you don't know what your role is. But when you recognize your quality and your flag and your role, that doesn't engender competition or arrogance or pride when you realize that really you're trying to strive through the will of God and God is the one who gave you all your qualities and therefore someone else who has the same goal, they may have different skill set because they have a different responsibility, but the goal and the objective is the same. You know, the non-Jews have flags also. So the Ramban, he writes that why do they why, why do they have why does every country have a flag? He says that this flag idea, this was all, like a lot of other good ideas, pilfered from us. This is plagiarized. This is we start off with the flag and says, "Oh, we want to be like them. They, we want to get our flags as well." Uh, but for them, the, what does the flag represent? Maybe it has representation, but it doesn't actually uh, it doesn't actually connote the particular qualities. It's just a matter of national pride. Here, the flags that we're given really have a deep message and a deep under, understanding of what we are as a tribe, but ultimately what we what we're trying to do as a nation. So it, it goes through the encampments. So there's four groups, and there's the group of uh, Judah, and he has with him Yesachar and Zevulon, and then there is Ruvain. So wait, they are in the east, and then in the south, you have Ruvain, together with Shimon and God. And then you have Ephraim and Manasseh and Benjamin and Don, Naphtali and Usher. So that's the 12 tribes and how they were encamped. A few interesting things I want to point out here. If you look at Zevulon in verse 7, there is a slight difference, discrepancy between how the verse of Zavulon is mentioned versus all the other equivalent uh, tribes in the other sections. It, there's one letter missing. It doesn't say above, which means and. And we know Yisachar and Zavulon, they're, they're teammates. They're, they're, they're partners. Yisachar was the one who studied Torah, and Zavulon was the one who supported him. So in the preceding verse, it talks about Yisachar. And then in the ensuing verse, it refers to Zvulon. But there's no vav, there's no connecting and word between the two. And I saw one of the commentaries writes that it doesn't say and the tribe of Zvulon, it says the tribe of Zvulon because it's to show the unity of this partnership. Yisachar and Zvulon, they were partners, but they kind of morphed into one as if they're one tribe because they were towards a common goal and they were together and they were the same. Like the Zavulon, the, the, he was the um, commerce, big, big business. And Yisachar, they, they were scholars. Um, but they had a partnership going. And the verse says that, it, that they kind of morphed into one and it's, um, it's the way to kind of buy your way a, le- a legacy uh, that the Zavulon chose to support Yisachar and they became teammates and they became indistinguishable. That's one interesting note. Uh, also, there's um, something that you probably wouldn't pick up if you just read it, but verse 14 talks about God. God, uh, his, the, the prince or the president, the leader of the, of the people of God was El Yasaf ben Reuel. And this Reuel, this name appears five times in the book of Numbers. Four out of five times it appears as Deuel, which means no God. Reuel means companion of God, friend of God. So why is it changing his name over here? It's really striking that one place says four places it says Deuel, no God, and one in one of five places it says Reuel, which means a friend or companion of God. 
Uh, and obviously, this is not a typo. There's no typos in the Torah. So one of the commentaries explains that if you notice the four heads – uh, the four leaders of these four groups, all of them are firstborns. So you have the firstborn, Ruvain. Jacob had four wives, and the, the the premier son of each one of those four wives is heading one of these four groups. Now, God, he really should have been one of them. But he had to cede his position as being a leader to Ruvain. Oh, I'm sorry, to Judah. Because Judah, he kind of rose to prominence, became the family of the monarchy, and he had to see, uh, and God had to cede it. And therefore, because he was the one who forfeited, so to speak, God forfeited uh, his particular uh, prestige for someone else, the Torah points out to doing like that makes him a friend of God. When someone is able to forfeit what they have, what they should have had by right, uh, for someone else, it, they become a friend of God. And additionally, when Moshe died, he died on the other side of the Jordan, Transjordan, on the east bank of Jordan. And we don't know where he's buried, but we know that that part was captured by the Jews as well. So biblical Israel extends on the other side of the Jordan as well. But whose tribe, who owned that land? Which tribe, tribe owned that land? God. Perhaps those have argued, that there have been people that have argued that the reason why the tribe of God merited to have Moshe buried in their land was because of this particular action of, of, of not invoking their particular rights and not, and not making a big a hubbub uh, over what really they deserve and allowing someone else to have it and having the pride. They actually ended up with um, uh, a nice, amazing benefit to have Moshe buried forever in their not forever until he's resuscitated uh, in in their in their land. Okay, chapter three starts off with a very peculiar verse. It doesn't seem so peculiar, but if you read a little further, it does. These are the sons of Aaron and Moshe. Now we're starting to count Aaron and Moshe. That's the family of the Levites. One so could start counting them. The sons of Aaron and Moshe. And it starts counting the sons of Aaron. And nowhere in the ensuing verses does it count the sons of Moshe. So Rashi asks the obvious question, why does it preface this section by saying these are the sons of Aaron and Moshe when it only counts the sons of Aaron and not the sons of Moshe? And Rashi tells us very famously, Moshe indeed didn't father Aaron's children, but he did teach them Torah. And someone who teaches someone else Torah, it's as if they father them. And therefore, it's appropriate to say that Moshe was the father of the sons of Aaron because he taught them Torah. Uh, but I, I think that the, the, the idea can be understood on a very deep level. A father, well, what is his role? Um, in time-wise, to, to, to be a father, is not, it's, not, it's not such an exhaustive to – be, to, to be a dad maybe takes a long time. But to be a father, father, someone, it, it's, it's a contribution of a primordial biological matter and that's it. But it's giving life. But what kind of life is it giving? It's giving physical life. Teaching Torah is also giving life. But it's not giving physical life. It's giving spiritual life. But it's giving life nonetheless. So when someone teaches someone else Torah – it's exactly like being a father to them. It's a, not a father necessarily in this world, in the physical realm, but it's a, being a father in the spiritual realm. It's being a father of their soul. It's giving life to their soul, but it's the exact equivalent of being a father. Very powerful idea. It lists the, it lists the sons of Aaron. And of course, two of Aaron's sons had died. In verse number four here, not that one of you died when they brought a foreign fire before Hashem and they didn't have any sons. So they themselves didn't have any descendants. The question is, what's the relevance of the fact that Nadav and Aviyu did not have any sons? Says the Talmud. But had they had sons, they wouldn't have died. They died and they didn't have any sons. But had they had sons, they wouldn't have died. Why? Because someone who has children, they can die because there is a certain part of them, so to speak, that's living on in continuity in their children. Very powerful idea of what it means to be to have children. But additionally, you look at the juxtaposition here. Nadav died before Hashem when they brought a foreign fire. 
in the wilderness of Sinai and they didn't have any sons. It seems to imply that if they did have sons, they wouldn't have died. So we said one reason, because they would, they would have had continuity. But maybe we can even say that had they had sons, they wouldn't have died the physical death with the foreign – they wouldn't have even brought the foreign fire. My grandfather, of blessed memory, used to say that the best tool for improving one's character is having children. Because children demand a person perfect their character. Because you need to have endless patience for them and you have to think about other people. You have to care for them. You have to worry about them. That teaches a person how to become a better person. Perhaps the verse is, is, is implying that not even a view, they didn't have children. Had they had children, maybe, just maybe, they wouldn't have sinned and they would have still been alive. I, maybe it's an idea there uh, uh, to suggest. So the Levites... Are so we, we enumerate the sons of Aaron, they're the Kohanes, they have their responsibilities. And what about the Levites? The Levites weren't counted, but they have a special status, and they're going to be um, counted individually from the age of one month and on. They are counted now. There's, um, and, and the verse tells us that Moshe goes and counts Al Pi Hashem as per the word of God. As he was instructed. So very another strange verse here that's describing verse 16, that Moshe counted as per what God told him. So did he count or did God count? So Rashi says that, remember, he has to count from one age of one month. So there's a little child in a bassinet. Moshe has to count all those children. If it's 20-year-olds, so Moshe can count 20-year-olds, line them up. But he has to go into the, into the bassinets and inspect all the kids. So Moshe, Rashi tells us an amazing, an amazing dialogue that happens here between God and Moshe. Moshe says to God, how am I going to count? Am I going to go into everyone's tent and start counting how many kids they have? So God says to them, Asei ata et shalcha, ani shali. Very powerful idea. God says to Moshe, you do your job, let me do my job. Why? So when Moshe went to the entrance of every tent, and God would give him a prophetic voice from inside the tent and tell him how many children, how many babies there were inside the tent. And that's how he did the counting. So he did the counting, Moshe did the counting as per the word of God. That's how Rashi explains it. But I think that that's a good tagline. You do your job and don't worry about God's job. You know, a lot of people say, we're, we're so much more worried about how God is much more proficient at his job than we are at ours. Yet see, we seem to be worried about his job a lot more than we worry about our job. A lot of people say, "How?" I, I gave, gave this example before, so I could say it kind of quickly here. How are we going to achieve light to the nation when God doesn't tell us to go out and proselytize and teach the world? You do your job like God do his job. And you see, like, like God's much, much more uh, equipped at doing his uh, than we are at doing ours. And we don't need to worry about his, just do ours, and he will do his guaranteed. Okay, so we count the son, the children of Aaron. It goes through all the, um, the the tribes of Levi. It goes through the three sons of Levi in all their families. And the final number is 22,000. And if you actually compare this to all the other tribes, it's much smaller, much smaller number. The Levites were much smaller. Why? It seems strange with the Levites, the Legion of God. These are the ones that have the fewest by far of all the tribes. So I saw an amazing... Rashi of to explain this. We, we're told in the beginning of Exodus that the more Pharaoh enslaved the Jews and mistreated them, the more they grew. Pharaoh wanted to curb the population and it had the exact opposite effect. The more he tried to minimize them, the greater they grew. But we know, we mentioned this earlier, the Levites, they weren't enslaved. The Levites were never enslaved in Egypt. And therefore, they never got corrupted and never did the golden calf. They were separate. They were distinct. But they, they were never enslaved. So therefore, the special blessing that was given to the people in Egypt, that it had the reverse effect of trying to limit them. They grew in proportion to how harsh their enslavement were. That didn't apply to the Levites. And therefore, the Levites, yes, they, didn't, they weren't enslaved and that was a benefit for them. But they also didn't have the blessing that came with it to, be, uh, to propagate in huge numbers.
the reason why the Levites were enslaved were not – the reason why the Levites were not enslaved is because the way Pharaoh – the way he devilishly began the enslavement is that at first he made it by volunteer and he, got, he paid them and even he himself participated and he kind of hoodwinked them into joining. And the people, they started joining the, and once they did it and were paid, he withdrew the pay and said, you got to continue doing it. It's patriotic, patriotic duty. And then it got harsher and harsher progressively. But the ones who didn't fall for his tricks at the beginning, they were never part of this system, and they were never enslaved. Couldn't he have made them part? I mean, couldn't he have enslaved them if he wanted to? Remember, all the way since the time of Le- uh, of Joseph, the the clergy were on a different level. Remember, Joseph didn't take away the the land of the clergy. Remember when Joseph we stockpiled all the money and all the assets for Pharaoh? He didn't take with the clergy. It's always uh, there was always a deference for the um, in Egypt. There was always a deference for the clergy. As in the times of, of Joseph, and therefore the Levites were the clergy, the Jewish people, they weren't enslaved. Interesting idea. Okay, so count the, the Levites, and then there's this process of swapping where the Levites and the firstborn are swapped. If you remember, we mentioned this earlier, that the firstborn were really designated to be the people of God. When God killed the firstborn of the Egyptians but saved the firstborn of, of Israelites, they were given a certain a status. And in this parsha, they transfer the status. All the firstborn, every firstborn and uh, and every Levite, they swap. And there's only 273 more firstborn than there are Levites. And therefore, those 273 firstborn that have a certain heightened spiritual status, but they want to undo it because they're not going to be the Levites. They have to pay their buy their way out in a similar way to when the firstborn today is born. When there's a firstborn born today, there's a process that we uh, that's called Pedion Aben, where you redeem the child because there's a certain spiritual elevation given to firstborn. And therefore, if they want to kind of be a regular guy, they have to buy their way out. And that began over there. Okay. Um, Chapter 4 talks about a third counting, um, uh, well, a third counting, the Israelites, the Levites, and the Levites again, that began at the age of 30. At the age of 30 to the age of 50, that's when the Levites would do work in the temple. And therefore, they were count, that group was counted, uh, independently, and in next week's partial, we'll read about that counting. And the parsha ends with giving the list of jobs for the Levites, uh, of what they would do because they were they were the, cus- the custodians, the ushers in the temple. They didn't do the actual work in the temple. They did all the ancillary work. So they, for example, when they transported uh, the tabernacle from place to place, they would disassemble it, put it each into their boxes and in, into their satchels, and the Levites would carry them. And each group of Levites was responsible for different parts of the tabernacle. And here it lists what parts were given to each family. There's an interesting note here at the end. It says that Elazar, the son of Aaron, who became his heir, um, he, he himself was also tasked with carrying a bunch of stuff. What was he in charge of? The oil of illumination, the incense spices, the meal offerings of the continual offerings, the anointment oil, the charge of the entire tabernacle and everything in it of the sanctuaries and its utensils. The Ramban does a calculation of how much stuff Elazar, Elazar himself had to carry, and it turns out it's around 1,000 kilos. More or less. My grandfather used to say, if anyone says, I have too heavy a burden on my back, I can't handle it. It's too much work. He always used to say, just thank, be thankful that it's not as much as Elazar has because he had the biggest load of any, of any one of them. And what Ramban says is that just like Jacob was blessed with a certain supernatural power, he got to the rock and he just pushed it over as if it was a little pebble uh, when before he met Rachel – so too, Elazar was granted this spe- special supernatural strength, and he was able to carry that load. But moreover, I think the lesson for us is, is that God does not give anyone a burden they cannot bear. Broadly speaking, I told this to someone on Shabbos uh, who has a few children. I said, to, and his first son was somewhat of a, a very challenging child. And I, I said, it's a theme, first born sons are challenging. And the reason why is because you start off and you only have as one child. So that gives you more, the most challenging child up front. But then you have your sixth or seventh child, you know, you're tapped out, so to speak, it'll be easy. Because the might doesn't give anyone a burden they cannot handle. 
I think it's a good lesson for us. You know, we think, oh, I'm so busy. I can't handle it. No, no, no. You could, you, you could always – the Almighty will not give someone a challenge that they cannot bear. And the parsha ends with a um, exhortation for people to maintain the holiness of these vessels. Don't look at the vessels before they're put into their sheaths to be carried. They maintain their spiritual heightened status even uh, at the time. If you look at it in the improper way, you might die, which is unfortunate.